Hi everyone, uh, good Monday, happy Monday. Uh, it's Monday today, not Thursday. Um, let me just make a couple of little adjustments. So we... Uh, and um, for some reason, just looking at the control panel thing that we have, um, normally our sort of 15, 20 second delay at the moment looks like about a minute, um, which is a bit, bit extreme, but there we go. Uh, maybe they're just punishing me for moving the date. Um, so this is going to be the first of two sessions we do this week. We'll do one today on Monday and one as normal on Thursday. Um, so this Thursday coming is the 50, what is that, 15th? Yeah, something like that. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, to those of you that are normally here on a Thursday, um, sorry we moved it. To those of you that have never been here before, it doesn't matter what day it is because it's new to you. So let's just get uh, into Capture One. Now I mentioned this on Instagram earlier, Capture One has released a new build. Uh, I think it was the end of last week, um, so 13.1.3. Um, in marketing terms, it's still version 20. That's still the version that uh, everyone should refer to. It's Capture One version 20, but it's 13.1.3. The way that you check that is you go to the About screen and it will say, and in fact, it'll actually say 13.1.3.9, which is the exact build number that you should be on. So for those of you that don't have an uh, up-to-date version, Go to CaptureOne.com, um, download it. If you subscribe, that download is free. If you've already paid for a perpetual license for version 20, that download is also free. If you're on an older version than Capture One, then I would encourage you to get up to date um, because there's a lot of things that we'll show you, um, it's certainly in this session, that are only in 20.1 and beyond, um, certainly some of the functions. Okay, so that said, uh, today's session, uh, let's go in. So uh, we're going to go through some mountain stuff, uh, some uh, animal stuff, dog stuff, uh, a cool shot with uh, Greenland, and we'll probably get on to Earl's um, waterfall shot as well. Um, so to those of you that were asking, yes, it was good to be out shooting last week. It's the first time in ages I've actually done the whole sunrise for a few days in a row. First time I've been permanently tired for a week. Um, but it was also the first time I've been out breathing fresh air and actually shooting permanently um, rather than coming back and editing. Um, so there we go. We'll do more of that, hopefully. Right. So here is our Capture One um, entrance. Just one thing I want to cover. Um, funnily enough, David Grover and I were um, briefly discussing this this morning. Um, more and more people, as we go on, are downloading and trying out new operating systems, <laughs> namely Big Sur. Um, so Apple are obviously about to release um, Big Sur, it's their next new operating system upgrade. Just, uh, I want to use a, a different term for the word beta tester, which is, um, let's call it free lemmings or cannon fodder. Um, now, beta testing is a really important part of any software process. Um, it's the stage that software companies go through to make sure their software works because they can't check every possible eventuality out there in the world. But what they can do is make sure that it's really, really hardened before it's ready for public beta testing. And what we're seeing more and more around the internet is a lot of people complaining that their software is not working. And then when you dig into it, actually one of the reasons is because they're running Big Sur, which is a beta version of software. So for those of you on Macs, if you remember when the update to Catalina happened, um, which was a little while ago now, all of a sudden people complained that tethering was broken and um, Capture One would crash and Photoshop would have a problem and all these, these other things that were going on and file permissions and their video conferencing didn't work, which wasn't great given what we were about to go into. But these are the bugs that are ironed out, hopefully in beta, but more and more companies are using the actual release to iron out their first set of bugs. So do not, on a production system, install beta software unless you are happy to lose everything. So if you are happy to lose everything, then by all means, um, install the beta and, and that's wonderful. But if you're not, then just be really careful um, with what you install. For some reason, we're having a bit of a connection problem, which is strange. Um, but hopefully it's, uh, it's ironing out. Some of you are saying it's stuttering, but it's now smooth and it's now settled down. Um, so let's hope that's the case. Okay. So yeah, back to beta software. Capture One have beta software out there. Um, use it at your own risk. Apple will release new operating systems. Use that at your own risk. But just bear in mind, if you're using beta software, if you have a spare system, no problem. If you're relying on your main production system, please wait until a version or two after the little point releases that are really, really important. There we go. That's school over for the day. Um, okay. 
So let's go on to uh, Jerome's uh, picture. So the, the question that Jerome had was, how do we get this to be more um, vivid, more vibrant, um, more detailed? It's a wonderful shot. I'm guessing it's in the Nordics somewhere, probably Norway. I don't know, maybe Sweden. We'll, we'll find out hopefully if Jerome's on. Um, so let's just have a little look at what we can do to really make this pop. So first thing is we're at a reasonable aperture. We're at 7.1. Let's just have a little look at what we captured. Nice and sharp all the way through. Um, out here we've got some detail in the background, but it's been well pretty much washed out um, and overexposed. So on our lens um, calibration, that's already in place. No worries there. Uh, when it gets to things like purple fringing, I'm not seeing anything in there, so we don't need to dial any of those things in. And the sharpness is pretty consistent even out to the edge of the frame, so I'm not going to really touch these dials on the lens correction tab. What we are going to do is go straight to the exposure tab. So on our exposure tab, we can now play and see what we can get out of this detail. First thing to do, and we, we talk about this a lot, of course, if you've got a massive difference between the shadows and the highlights, maybe it's worth going onto your color tab and trying the linear response curve. Great. That's going to flatten the image. It's going to calm everything down. It's going to reduce the um, issues in, in terms of the, the spiking of highlights and shadows. But in this case, we didn't really have any spiking. It's just very, very much biased towards the high, or highlights. OK, so let's leave it at auto and let's see what we can do to pull it down. And we can see on the histogram what's there. OK. Let's just then play with pulling this down a little bit. So first thing, levels. We talk about this a lot and we often do it last, but in this case, I want to see what we can get out of the image before we make any other decisions around the other sliders. So let's first of all pull down our exposure and just make sure we have got the detail there. And we do. There's loads of dynamic range in this camera. I'm guessing, uh, where are we? Where's our camera? XE2S. Not sure what model that is. Good dynamic range in there though, because it's captured all of this information. So with that known, and we can pull our exposure down, we can get to a place where actually we can then use our levels to stretch that term histogram. So remember, sorry, I'm just gonna pull. So all of you are saying it seems to have improved. I think there's something weird with YouTube's feed, um, which is a bit odd. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but from here, everything's OK. From your ends, everything looked OK. But for some reason, the blip was a bit weird. So we may have to upload the um, the full recording later so you can see it without any uh, <laughs> without any blips. Um, David's saying in Nova Scotia, YouTube's fine. So um, if we all move to Nova Scotia, then we'll, we'll be OK. Um, failing that, maybe there's a bit of a bit of a server problem. OK, we'll fix it for the rerun anyway. So hopefully that's all all good. Right. So we've established in this picture by pulling the exposure down that we've got detail in all those highlights, but we're just not displaying it because it's all crunched up here on the top right. OK. And we also know that with that dynamic range, we've got a lot of latitude to pull it down. Now, by pulling it down, I don't actually want to do exposure for that, because if I pull down just exposure, I slide the entire image down to the left. So while that's great, it's pulling down all these highlights and we can see those highlights there in the middle. What's not so great is we've also pulled down all of this detail here. So all of that stuff starts to look flat and a little bit shadowy and, and not particularly nice. So instead of that, we're going to use our, our levels. Now, for those of you that are familiar now with levels and quite a few of you that have been online for a while will know this. The difference with exposure and brightness is that exposure shifts the whole lot down left or right. Brightness sort of squashes, so it pushes the highlights down if you go to the left or it pushes the shadows up and goes to the right but it doesn't necessarily push the ends off of the end of the, the histogram. What levels does though, which is different, is it allows us to stretch the histogram. So rather than shifting left or right, we can actually pull the histogram or squeeze the histogram to fill or to, to be shallower or narrower um, and reduce contrast if we want to. In this case, we're gonna increase contrast. So with our levels down here, we can see we've got a lot of information here up in the highlights. We're gonna fix that maybe a little bit with some HDR tools. On the left hand side, we've got a lot of room here in the shadows. We can effectively bring some of this stuff down and make it pop a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch the histogram by telling Capture One what was zero came out as zero. So zero at the bottom became zero at the top. Now, I want you to make what was 24. So not quite a shadow now become zero. 
So effectively take the histogram and squeeze or push it out. So stretch it out. So the shadows become shadows or the darker areas become darker and more shadows. But we're leaving the highlights where they were. They're at 255 still. And then with those highlights and with the white, we can actually pull down our high dynamic range there and even the whites if we want to. Now, the problem here is the sky itself, a little bit flat, it's a little bit dull. We don't want to do this too much because what you'll end up with is this haloing here around these edges. We don't like that. So let's leave the whites a little bit back from where they were. But we can pull down highlights a touch. Cool. And we can actually now pull our exposure down just a little bit. So you see the difference that's made. So without changing anything else, without changing anything in terms of color balance, which we'll do in a second, or white balance, or, or any of the contrast tools or anything like that, just by stretching that histogram and by pulling down some of the highlights and, um, and whites into the, the uh, recovered area, we've now got a lot more information. So let's just look at before and after. There's before, there's after. Now, Again, this may be too much. It depends on your view of things. So if we're not happy with how much this has come down, well, we can just dial back these high dynamic range sliders a little bit. And generally, generally speaking on these, less is more. Please, please, please use less rather than more. And we then keep the sort of misty, foggy sort of feel to it. But we're getting back all this information out here that was kind of blown. And what we've also got is this light streak now, this diagonal light streak, a bit clearer than it was before, before it was lost into those overexposed highlights. Uh, Jerome's just said it's the Turda Mountains in Romania. There we go. Um, so those of you that want to head to Romania in the winter, you go for it and you might get a cool shot. Um, so in this case, we've now got a what I would consider more detailed, more poppy, more vibrant shot of the same scene. But it's now turned really, really blue. And I don't mean cold, I mean blue, and that's a problem. So white balance is fine, but it's got to feel natural. So if we push it a bit to the warm side, we might be able to correct some of this. And one of the ways that I'm looking at this is you see these numbers at the top. So 219, 229, 240, and so on. Red value, green value, blue value, obviously, and then overall luminosity. If I put my cursor over here, we can see that swing to the blue. You've got 106 red, 135 green, 168 blue. Now, if I go to the snow, so snow in theory would be white. Of course, this is in the shade, so you're going to get a little bit of a shift. But look at that, 151, 172, 204. It is heavily swung towards blue. If I go back to our before, and let's just, uh, let me just create a variant and reset it. If I go back to our before, you see now these numbers are a little closer together. Not massively, but they're a little bit closer together. 187, 204, 229. So what's happened is we've had a little bit of a shift as a result of pulling back the highlights. So we can correct that with our white balance. Let's go back to our, our new version. And with this, we're going to go to our white balance. Now let's try capture one's built-in white balance picker. So we click on the little picker thing, and we've got to choose something that should be gray. Now it doesn't have to be white, it doesn't have to be black, it doesn't have to be actually middle gray. It can be anything that shouldn't have a color. Now we talk about these every now and then, about the fact that if you try and do this at sunset or sunrise, it's really difficult because the things that are gray, the light falling on them is a little bit warmer than the normal, so it wouldn't necessarily be gray. Same with blue hour. The same can be said for the shade, but let's just try it. Let's click in there now. Now we have a very different scene. And I think my gut feel is this is probably too warm. So if we were to play with this, I think my, my gut feel again is it's going to be somewhere in between the two. So the automatic one is going to be too warm. The um, default as shot by the camera, I think, is too cool in this case after we've done the corrections for our highlights. So we're going to pull this back manually. And we're going to get to a place that's nice and sort of middle ground on this. But there, that feels like winter. That's really nice. So again, if I go before and after, to me, now maybe that's a little bit too pink. Um, so if it is, we've got the tint. So remember, these two go from Kelvin being blue to yellow, effectively. So cold light to warm light. And tint goes from green to magenta. So the tint was designed to fix color cast on things like filters and glass. Um, but in effect, it, it shifts the balance in your image from green up to pink. So what we've got to find is somewhere in between that's pretty neutral 
um, but still accurate in terms of the temperature that this this shot should feel. Um, so Carlos just asked, do we ever use the individual color channel levels tool? So let me just show you what we mean by that. So I'm going to clone this variant. We're staying on the background thing. Now in this levels tool here, uh, let's just remember these numbers. So we've got 24, uh, 0, and 255. Fine. I'm going to reset our levels tool. Now, what we can do is we can go individually into these and we can actually pull the blue channel, for example, up on its own, or the green channel up on its own. So we can do it level by level. The other alternative, however, in Capture One is under our preferences, just so you can see here, under, let me just remember, uh, our exposure tab in preferences, you've got under the levels tool, the channel mode, RGB. Now, it, this allows you in Capture One to get, let Capture One make decisions based on the three individual channels rather than as a collection. So the levels tool as default, where it says RGB channel, is basically looking at luminosity. So if we go to the RGB tab here, it's basically looking at where is their data, where is their not data, and we're just pulling all the levels in the same way. But if we wanted Capture One in terms of auto levels to do it individually, and the same with shadow and the same with highlights and so on. Then we can choose this setting here, red, green, and blue, and it will look at it separately for each different channel. So let me just show you what that actually does. Let's go to RGB. So in RGB, this is the standard out of the box um, version, and I'm gonna press the little uh, wizard thing and say auto levels, done. Okay, I'm now gonna undo that, and let's go to our preferences. So under preferences, we've got red, green, and blue channels now instead. And on the red, green, and blue, this, remember, is for auto. On the red, green, and blue, if I now go to our same picker, we get a very different feel. And the reason is because it shifted those channels individually. It's shifted the red, the green, and the blue in isolation. So if I go to clone this variant, let's just undo our levels tool here so we can have a look at them side by side, which kind of helps. Let's go back to RGB. So in my preferences, RGB channel. Let's do an auto levels. So that's auto levels with all the channels dealt with the same. This is levels with individual channels dealt with the same. Now, in this case, they're very similar. They're very, very similar. In fact, the only difference really I can see is this out here is a little bit more green than in this one. It's gone a little bit more pink. So in some images, you're not going to notice any difference. In others, you're going to see a wild swing from red to green to blue. Some people have it as default as individual channels and they use the auto levels. Personally, again, this is only uh, my view rather than anyone else's. Personally, I wouldn't bother with auto levels. If you want to play with individual channels, play with them or just do the manual RGB. OK, so when we get to this sort of stage here, well, now what we have got is the opportunity to put in a little bit of clarity. Now, be careful, because if we push up clarity too much, yes, we get the sort of woo pop, but we also get this haloing around these edges. So remember, the clarity tool, one of the downsides to it, if you overuse it, is you end up with haloing around the edges. And those halos are typically found where there's a dark and a light section. And on the darker side, you'll end up with a darker side um, or an even darker side to counteract the white side or the lighter area. So with that clarity set, this is just too much up on these mountains. But down here, it's kind of cool. So maybe we want to do this, but maybe we want to do it with a bit of a mask. And I'm actually going to cheat and find a way of doing this where I don't have to do much because we're going to allow for a fall off. So I'm going to press M on my keyboard so I can see the mask while I'm drawing it. And we're going to draw a really soft mask here. The way I make it softer is we bring in this little um, central circle. And the way that the mask determines its softness is the distance between this line here and this line here. Great. So with that all done, We've now got a really soft fall off from the top to the bottom and into this central part. But this is the wrong way, because remember, I want to increase clarity down here, not at the top where we're going to get all that haloing. So what I'm going to do instead, really easy, right click, invert mask. So now I'm doing the opposite. So the bit that I'm masking is the bit in the center, not the bit at the edges. And now I can see this area that I'm going to affect. Looking pretty good. So let's press M to get rid of our mask so I can see the picture. And with that mask, I'm going to increase on clarity, but only down here at the bottom. 
So you see we're not making any difference up here to the bit that should be in the foggy area, the, the stuff that should be a bit misty, a bit unclear, so no clarity in that sense. We can also use structure a little bit, but I'm going to use that on the whole background. And the reason we're going to use structure a bit is I want to pull out some of these leaves just a touch. Now structure, again, be really careful. Don't overdo it. You end up with an over sharpened image, but a couple of little notches on there really bring out all the details. Okay. So the overall, where we're at with this. So I think, I can't remember who said it was uh, earlier. Where are we? Um, someone, oh, it was, oh. Um, so actually I, I like um, Joren's image as it is. Wouldn't do much with it. I agree. Um, so the initial image, nothing wrong with it. Really great. Really like it. However, there's our initial image. There's where we get to. So even though I'd say there's nothing wrong with the original image, the final one, the version of this, just has a bit more detail about it. It's just a bit more poppy. It's a bit more vivid, a bit more vibrant. Um, and to me, that has an, an extra sort of added bonus when you go and put something like this on your wall. So it's completely up to you. Um, and of course, we could have done all of this stuff on a separate layer if we wanted to. That would have meant we can dial it back um, up and down. So for instance, we could do with this clarity one in the middle, we can just go for 100%, but actually we can dial it down to you know, 70, 80 or whatever. But overall, I like this shot. It feels cold, it feels right, it feels like winter. But this one feels like a more considered print. And that's sort of where I'd get to. Okay. Um, so if there are any questions on that one we can cover them failing that we can go um, across to the next one so david's just said uh, perhaps whiten the snow are nice but leave the rest blue it's a bit of a challenge when you do that because you know your eye does look at it and go huh that's odd and um, there's, a, there's a very big difference because up here we also have snow and ice um just on the mountaintop so it just feels weird if maybe the bottom half is cooler than the top half um it is to a certain extent naturally because this sits in the shade whereas this is up in the sunlight obviously um but i, I would be really really careful about doing a split tone um on this one um and Jochen's just said uh i'd love to do color correction or grading on a filled layer with the opacity set to 80 yeah so again that was um was what i was saying um at the end so we've done all this pretty much on the background layer it's mostly because I knew where we were going to take this image. If I was experimenting, just playing, um, or trying different things, so maybe we do one that's warmer, one that's cooler, you can absolutely do it on separate layers um, and just dial the opacity back and up or down, uh, depending on where you want to go uh, with that particular image. Okay, so that is first one, which is your, uh, your sorry, Jerome's image, not, uh, not Jochen's image. Okay, next one, Jeffrey. Um, so Jeffrey sent this one in. This is Jeffrey's dog that I hear is sadly no longer with us. But um, the idea here is let's get a really cool shot um, for Jeffrey to print. Um, and this is a really nice shot to start with. And the really cool bit with these ones is when you get to see the person taking the picture in their eye. So couple of things with this actually not much wrong with it and actually um jeffrey sent a couple through which um were, were his edits so this one a lot brighter a lot warmer this one obviously in black and white um we've got a lot more shadow um in here but let's go back to our original here and just consider what we might want to do so in my head immediately there's a couple of little changes that will uh, will make a big difference one is actually out here we've got this green tinge um around all of the highlight areas so all of the contrast areas here that's a bit of a distraction um, we'll see what we can do to try and limit that um, there are certain things that we can do it's not going to go away completely and it's actually a natural part of the bokeh fall off um, with the lens however let's see what we can do to try and uh, try and sort that out um, next one on I mean, f1.2 there's going to be hopefully no diffraction going on in there I did look at whether we could get this with purple fringing on the edges, but it's not. Um, it's not going to touch that at all. So on lens corrections, it's dialed in the right lens profile. Remember, if you don't see your lens, don't just go and grab another random one that's near enough. Use the generic lens profiles and try and dial it in from there. This one's picked up the right lens. So let's have a look. So the first thing we said was this green thing. The second thing, and it's, it's a tiny thing, but I just find it a little bit distracting is this part here this out of focus part and it's again it's it's the bokeh in, in the lens 
but it's very very pronounced this one particular piece and now i've said it you won't be able to unsee it unfortunately it's just that bit there so we're going to fix that too very easily and then we'll do some stuff uh, maybe with a little bit of adjustment on crop and our um, structure of the fur so let's start with our exposure tab um, and let's actually play with this one first so this little issue down here so what could I do? Well, number one, I could try a healing brush. I can tell you now before I even try it, um, it's not going to do a great job. So let's just draw. It doesn't really matter whether this is soft or not. It's going to fix it sort of, but you're going to see some sort of extra artifact where it's copied things in. You're going to notice that it's been healed in. And actually, we don't need to do that with the heal there. So instead, let's create another one and call it Oka Fix. Instead, let's create a mask. Again, just that, that area there. And with that mask, let's think about what we want to do. Well, we want to get rid of something that's really clear. So how do we get something rid of something really clear? Well, if we want to make things more clear, then we increase their clarity. So why don't I just decrease the clarity? And you see that started to get a little bit softer already. Not soft enough? Okay, so let's create another layer. Because remember, you can do these ones on top of each other. So you're not limited to just doing it once. Let's create another random little shape there. It doesn't really matter. With that shape, let's pull down our clarity again and pull down our structure a little bit. So again, we're, we're just softening it down really, really, really carefully. We don't want it to look obvious that I've got rid of it. But let me just show you. If I remove those two layers, we see this line here, especially if I zoom in. And if I turn these two layers on, that line pretty much disappears. If we really want to get rid of this top bit, we can go Boca Fix 3. Let's give it a go. If I can spell Boca, there we go. And let's go there with another little brush. And with that one, clarity down again. There we go. So we're now in a place where without those fixes, we've now got this really hard line that you now will really see. With those fixes, we've softened it. And that's all we've done it's just a softening of that particular line but it just means that that distraction has gone and we're now back to we're not seeing anything in the background that's that's even slightly distracting we're now back to our subject so let's have a little look at these edges these lines i'm going to create a new layer and we're going to go to green edge fix now if i'm honest i am not sure this is going to work that well um, but i'm going to give it a go because i've done something very similar before we're going to create a mask on that layer and that mask is going to be a really 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 small line basically around the edge and for those of you that are a couple of steps before or ahead of the others you can imagine the next tool i'm going to go into because what i want to do i want to adjust the color around this mask now i've got to be really careful around this edge here because what i don't want to do is get rid of the green from the green parts of the background so as we come into his ears, although Jeffrey, I'm not sure if it's a he or a she, sorry, if I get it wrong, um, apologies. Um, so along we go here, along this edge with all this green tint along there. Not too worried about up here because the background genuinely is green, so we're good with that one. Um, along here, I'm just going to fix a little bit, but I'm coming in towards the fur and away from the background as I do it because I don't want to turn this stuff um to be not saturated it should remain green and there and there we go so that's our line drawn around where those green parts were let's turn our mask off and let's just zoom in maybe to here so there's our green edge fixed layer i'm going to go back to my color tab with the color tab we can go to our advanced setting on color editor and we can choose this color now, actually, we said it was green. Hmm, it's not. It's kind of cyan down there. Here it's green. Hmm, this could be a problem, couldn't it? So here it's more cyan. Here it's more cyan. Uh, where are we? Up here. It's in the green. So what that tells us is we need quite a wide arc. And that's the reason why we're in the advanced color editor. If we're in the advanced color editor, we can change the properties. If we stay on the basic editor, I'm stuck here with green or cyan or blue, and they're, they're slices of that rainbow, but they're not going to be quite as smooth as we want. You can adjust where those sectors are. You can actually click on these three dots and you can change the sectors. 
but that's quite a global adjustment I don't really want to do. Instead, I can just go to my advanced tab and say, actually, anything in this arc I now want to affect. And I'm going to affect it in a way by pulling down saturation. So look at what's happened there. So let me just do a temporary undo. There's our green line. And redo. There's our no green line. Green line, no green line. Perfect. So let's look at this edge here. And let's go temporarily undo. There's our green line all the way along here. Let's not undo. And now we've got rid of that line. So if ever, that's actually worked better than I thought it was. So I thought it would. So there we go. So if ever you have this, especially in a high contrast scenario where the edge falls out into the, the out of focus region, what you can find is you get this sort of uh, either green or purple um, fringe around it. Purple fringing won't necessarily fix this. So on the lens tab, you have the option of fixing um, the defringe. You can actually go into negative um, versions, which goes, I think, and that hits the green area. But because it's such a wide band, Capture One doesn't always see it as fringing. It just sees it as part of the image. If it was a really, really tight band around a high contrast point, that would fix it as well. But it's not going to because this is such a wide band. Whereas that little trick there, so we've got a mask around the edge of the line. And we're not we're not affecting and we're not changing exposure we're not changing contrast we are purely telling capture one that if you are in this green area along here let's just go into all of these areas here this area here is the one that i adjusted i've got a, quite a few different areas that i was playing with um so this particular arc here take the saturation down by 76 so that's way way down so basically get rid of any saturation out of that green but only along those edges and you end up with this real improvement around these edges here and, and now i've shown you that you now won't be able to see the or you won't be able to unsee the green around there that looks a lot better okay uh martin's just asked will a negative structure along with negative clarity help the softening effect uh this here it will it, hmm, ish so what we're referring to is these bokeh fixes um the problem with structure is structure is a lot more local so structure is going to affect edges and textures it's not necessarily going to affect areas and in this one it's the area that's the that's the uh, the key bit so i can dial down structure and it's not going to do any harm but it's not going to get rid of that that line effectively between the dark and the light area as well as a clarity change will okay uh other one the blue channel is clipping in the shadows is an issue if you want to print this image could we get a better print without clipping in the shadows um is it clipping hmm let's have a look um so will you get a better um, print image it depends if, if your shadows are true black um and you've got a bit of clipping in the shadows um then actually i wouldn't worry about it too much they're not actually clipping looking at uh let's try and find our darkest areas that's pretty much it in there, isn't it? So if I look at my numbers along the top, blue channel's still got five. Um, so even though on the histogram, and just be careful with the histogram, the histogram is a representation. We can pull the histogram out. In fact, we can even make it bigger in the sidebar here. Um, it's telling you to be careful, but I don't see that necessarily as clipping, and certainly it falls down before the very end of it. So the dynamic range of this camera has captured more detail than we we think and it hasn't actually clipped down there i don't think um so i wouldn't worry about it in this particular shot okay uh so where to go from here well that's our bokeh fix that's our green edge fixed um, and if i just do a quick before and after we can see not much has changed yet so there's our before with our green edges here in this line and here's our after it's like a windscreen wiper um, we've fixed that line it's got softer and we've got rid of the green edges so what about the rest of the shot let's think about our composition so number one actually we've got a slight lean on this this ground uh, we can see it down here but we can also see it here on this horizon rather than a rotate i'm going to use the um the keystone tool to pull it so what we're going to do the top bit i'm going to leave as it is so we don't lose any information we don't we don't pull anything out of our crocs i want to keep as much of this kind as possible um, but down here we can see look this distance here and this distance here not quite right so let's just pull that down to there and apply now this gives me the opportunity now to change our crop a little bit so we're going to leave it as the original so on the crop tool hold down the mouse you get all the choices up you can have unconstrained original or whatever or you can choose one of the popular crops if you want a different aspect ratio really easy click on add aspect ratio and you can type in the uh, the dimensions that you want and you can then call it whatever you want but in this case we're going to keep it as the original and all i'm going to do is just pull it into here 
So I've got this area down here we're going to lose. This area up here we're going to lose. I'm happy with that. There we go. That just feels a bit tighter, a bit closer, a bit more, um, a bit more even down the bottom as well. Now that same trick we did just now, um, so with our little radial mask, I'm going to create a new layer and we're going to call it vignette, but not literal vignette because I don't actually want to vignette evenly around the edges. Instead, we're going to draw a radial mask to allow us to vignette around this guy here. Now again, same thing as before, the default is sort of here which means we're going to see a definite fall off between this area here, 100% of the mask, this area here, 0%, and this line here represents 50%. So I don't really want to get into a place where we can see the vignette or we can see the mask. It, by the way, just for reference, if you want to ever twist the, the circle, just go into uh, this line here. Don't be careful not to go onto the little dots, go into the line, and you can always rotate that circle around so let's just do there and now I'm going to soften it by making the middle line as far away as possible from the outer line good now with that done let's just go really out there so a real soft fall off press M on the keyboard again to get rid of our mask and with this we can then pull down our exposure just a touch so I'm pulling down our exposure on our vignette now I'm going to go back to the background and I'm going to pull up our brightness. So remember, what these are going to counter each other, obviously, but brightness and exposure do slightly different things. So exposure is going to pull that whole histogram and it's going to shift it to the left or the right, like on a skateboard, literally slide to the left, slide to the right. Brightness is going to squeeze the shadows up in this case without pushing the highlights off the edge. And if I went the other way, it would pull the shadows down, sorry, you pull the highlights down without squeezing the shadows off the edge. But the area in vignette that I had had no highlights in. So I'm actually happy just to move the whole thing across. This area here with this guy in, actually we have some shadows in there. So as I pull the brightness up, I'm pulling up our shadows more than I'm pushing the, the highlights off the edge. So we're having a squeezing effect on the overall image. So the overall image has its brightness increased a little bit, which squeezes that histogram, pulls up the shadows without pushing off the highlights. And then on our vignette, this area, we then take that whole histogram only in the red bits and we slide it back off to the, the left down into the shadows. Um, that really helps um, balance out those two, because if we use vignette just on its own or the radial tool just on its own, we can end up bringing the whole image down and we don't really want that. Okay, let's turn our mask off. So that's looking pretty good. Now, what we could do, we could have done the opposite, actually, thinking about it in hindsight. But instead, I'm just going to draw a very quick mask and we're going to um, have a little play with fur. So let's have a little look in here. He's really, really sharp. This is a really, really nice shot, especially on that eye. But what I could do is pull up our fur just a touch more. So let me just do that there. Oh, sorry, don't have a mask. <laughs> Let me just fill it for now. OK, so with our structure, structure is great for fur. If I pull that structure up, you can see all these individual hairs. Now, that's too much structure. I'm going to say out now, out loud now. Too much structure makes it over sharp. It sort of hurts to look at. But if I now just undo that temporarily, you can see how this doesn't look quite as crisp. So I want to increase our structure on the fur, but I don't want to do it on everything else. I don't want this part down here getting all this extra detail in. Um, certainly there's little bits in here. So let's just undo that so you can see. That's without, slightly out of focus, nice and soft. The second we dial in structure, that little window that was in focus now starts to become really, really pronounced. We don't want that. We want the focus to be on the dog. So let's zoom all the way out. And with our fur mask, which at the moment is solid, I'm going to right click on there and say clear mask and I'm going to get our paintbrush and let's just do a really 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 soft paint now I'm not too worried about this because I can dial it back so I'm literally going to keep it at sort of up there in the sorry so you can see hundreds of opacity so 100% opacity 100% flow really really soft and the reason is because if I don't like it I'm on a layer I can always pull that down the effect down that is so there's our mask done. Let's just add a little bit in there. 
and with that mask I'm going to zoom in now again I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when you're doing work on sharpening and structure and clarity try and do it zoomed in a little bit if you do it zoomed out you'll get an image that looks great when it's that big but when you print it up big you're going to see it's over sharp so make sure you're doing this at around 100 percent so let's pull up our structure there no more than that that's wonderful as it is so 48 it's a pretty high amount actually but what this is doing is it's only affecting the area that we masked it's not affecting anything down here this is still now out of focus it's not sharp at all it's not affecting anything down here so we're not getting any noise up or anything like that all we're doing is we're pulling back all of that detail on him there and your reflection in his eye cool so in general terms that's sort of where I'd be I might be tempted let me go back to our background layer or if I want to actually I can create a new oops, sorry filled layer let's just fill that mask and we're going to call this one white balance because if I don't like it I can dial it back so let's just warm him up a touch little bit of tint just to counter that okay so that's without quite cool and blue with you see it's a tiny adjustment it's really 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 small as far as adjustments go and then with our vignette actually if we want to now we've brightened up the base underlying image we can pull that down even more just to keep the focus really on in there okay all of those things really 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 small tiny changes so none of them are groundbreaking none of them are massive swings to the left or right in terms of color balance or anything like that but let's just have a look at our before and after and see the difference so there's our before and here's our after so it feels warmer it feels more inviting um, and we've got a lot more detail so if we go into here on his eye and look at before through to after that now really pops it really really stands out um, this will look really great um, when it's printed okay um, if we wanted to do one final thing if we really 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 want to um, in, or sort out our, um, our brightness I'm going to go back to my white balance layer uh, anyway just out of, out of habit and I'm going to pull down our levels just a touch just to get those whites the brightest parts of the image on our histogram here really up to the whites level if I just undo that so you can see so there's our undo and there's our redo it's just about when you print it remember especially when you print stuff on paper it tends to look a bit flatter a little bit darker than in reality when it's on the screen so as a result just be careful um, with it um, because it, it can be you can overdo it on screen um, just to try and adjust it for paper so if anything get a color managed screen get a color calibrated screen but if you don't have that just err on the side of being slightly brighter because when you print it obviously the print isn't typically backlit it's going to be um, lit from the front and not as bright as your screen is going to be in the office okay uh, right so there's our dog one um, and if I look at the edits before um was it sent in? sorry jeffrey sent in so here's the first edit um nothing wrong with that edit but this distracting thing is still there i've still got these green bits here and just feels a little bit washed out the black and white version is lovely but again we've still got this distraction here if i go into this one we've got rid of that distraction out of that side um, and it's still nice and soft and that that sort of adjustment that slight tilt um really really helps a little bit keep the focus on him okay uh let's have a look at a cool one uh carla literally a cool one it's an iceberg greenland cool um so again capture one's recognized the lens uh it's pulled in our sony 2870 uh seven well sorry 6.3 there's probably not much in the way of diffraction correction it needs to do yeah with and without no difference and again i keep repeating this but it's really important if you if the slider doesn't make any visual or discernible difference to the image don't use it use as little number of sliders as you can not as many as you can that's a general rule um, we might have a bit of a sharpness fall off um, issue here yeah a little bit you see in this area here especially on the iceberg i don't want to do it so much though that's the problem so out here it's a little bit soft here we're correcting for it but at the same time we're introducing some artifacts that I don't really want so I'm going to dial in a little bit of sharpness correction but not too much because our focus is actually right in the middle of the lens and that typically isn't affected by this slider the sharpness fall off slider only affects the edges of the lens not the middle which is typically the sharpest part so lovely uh, red sailboat 
Um, I know those those boat setups. Um, now we've got in here a real complex mix of color because we've got the red boat, we've got the warm sun uh, sunset or sunrise, whichever way over here, probably sunset. And here we've got our cool blue iceberg, but of course it's being offset by that sun. It's sort of looking a little bit greeny, a little bit murky, so we might want to have a little play, uh, a little play with it. Okay, so with that said, let's go immediately onto our exposure tab. So again. You'll notice we typically go to this tab first. You can, of course, go onto the color tab, especially if you wanted to do anything like switch to a linear response curve. So we talk about this quite a bit. My auto curve is the default that gets loaded in. Linear response is a flatter curve. And if you look at what's happening on the histogram, there's auto, there's linear response. And in an image where there's a huge difference between the highlights and the shadows, sometimes linear response can help you get started because it flattens down that, um, that that the uh, the ah, what's the word flattens down the difference <laughs> between those two extremes in your histogram okay so from there let's just uh a little look and we are going to go on to our white balance first let's have a little play we're not going to make a white balance adjustment across the whole scene but i want to see what we can do um, in terms of balancing this stuff out. So a tiny little shift to the left, we get that real cool blue back in the iceberg. So that's really, really nice. But I don't want to lose this sunset down here. Okay. A tiny little move to the right, and we get the lovely sunshine down here. We get it all falling on this ship, and we get the nice yellow through, that, um, through the archway, but we lose this one as well. Okay. So let's just have a little look at what we can do independently. So the two of them separately. How would we do that? Well, one way is a Luma range. So let's just do a quick play here. And we'll go sunset. And we're going to call, or we're going to draw, sorry, this area over here. I'm just going to put my mask on so you can see. And I'm going to be very, very rough on here. Uh, so I can't click to get it on the screen, hold on. Simon's just made a very good point. Dirtle Door was cold that day. It is a bit like a Greenland equivalent of Dirtle Door. Um, actually, Dirtle Door was really nice last week. Uh, it was really quite, um, really quite warm. But there we go. Um, but yes, I, I'm, on, I'm on that page, Simon. It is pretty much the ice version of Dirtle Door. Okay, so that's my area now highlighted. But obviously, if, if I make any changes to this now, let me turn the mask off. If I make some changes here, it's going to look weird because we've clipped some of this iceberg. So what we can do is we can use our Luma range to be able to select only the areas we're interested in. So the Luma range here represents your histogram. That histogram, obviously at the moment, so let's just whack it all the way up. So it basically says anything from zero to 255 in your mask. So remember, it's a Luma range on top of a mask. So all of this area down here, irrelevant to my Luma range. We're only talking about the area that's covered in red. So in the area that's covered in, or covered in red, anything from 0 to 255 is now masked. But I don't want that. I want it to stop as we get into these shadows. So I'm going to pull the range down until I get rid of anything. Oh, we can see that top left starting to fall off. So anything here that is not in the shadows, good, all the way through to our highlights. So effectively from the mid-tones and up. But we have a problem. And the problem is that look at these areas down here on the bottom right and along here. It's a really harsh cutoff. And the reason is because there's this line, it's a solid line that says, look, look at this range. If you are 126, you are not included in the mask. So out of 255, we've only got those that number of ranges in our range. So if you are 126, not masked. If you are 127, masked. It's that binary. So what Capture One does is it gives us this fall off option, which says we can ramp that fall off. So the easiest place to see this is down here on this bottom right, this little piece down here in the water. So the stuff that was 126 is not masked. The stuff that's 127 is. So we get this really hard line around it. As I start to pull this fall off down, you'll see that line softens and softens and softens until there's no discernible line there. And what that's saying is in the red area, anything that was 92, start to mask it all the way until 127 when I want 100% mask. So imagine this bottom bit is 0%, this bit is 100%. So if I get to 93, it's going to be, let's say, 3% mask. 94 is going to be 6% mask, all the way up until we get to 127. 
So this ramp, this fall off here, really helps with that smoothness that's going on. Now let's just zoom in a bit more and we can show you even better. So let's go to our display mask and actually I'm just going to switch something. On my mask tool here I can say display grayscale mask. Now let's go to my luma range. So not only do I have this fall off which has made it nice and soft. Okay. What I also have on here is a radius and a sensitivity. So our radius allows us to really soften those edges and our sensitivity basically allows us to choose how bl effectively how blurry the mask is and how accurate the mask is, so all the way up to 100, out of the radius. So the radius determines how far away from an edge the mask is going to blur. So I'm going to allow it to be a little bit softer with quite a wide radius and quite a wide fall off. So that's allowing me to choose certain areas of the image with a soft fall off before it gets into the areas that aren't masked. So my mask now has a soft fall off with it. And effectively, we've now got not only the area that I painted, but only the highlights in the area that I painted. In other words, the sunlight. So with this mask, the sunset, I can now increase my white balance and increase my tint a little bit. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to counter what I'm going to do to the background. So with the background, we're going to cool down our image. We can probably shift our tint a touch. But let's cool that down there. Okay, now with my sunset, I can warm it up a little bit more. Because remember, these are a bit of a seesaw. I've got one layer, the background, just saying everything gets cooler. I've got another layer, which is our sunset layer, which is this mask, which is everything gets warmer. So as I pull down one, I can pull up the other. And we're splitting those white balances so that we're getting back to, frankly, the coolness of those icebergs versus the warmth of that sunset that's coming in from the right-hand side. Now with that done on our sunset area, we can pull down our highlights a little bit. There we go. And our whites. So those real, real, real high or bright, bright highlights that are reflecting here off of that iceberg. We can pull those down. So we've got a bit more detail back and we can see all of these layers in the sky, which is really nice, those soft tones. Now overall in our image, we've also got a lot of latitude here in the shadows and in the highlights up here. So even though I've pulled down highlights in general in the sunset area, I'm going to actually afford the image a little bit of a stretch of its histogram. Not too much, that was a bit too much. Uh, probably about there, just to get that pop back between the shadows and the highlights. Now, what we can also do here, I'm loving this today, we're doing quite a lot of these. Um, let's draw in a little radial mask. So, new layer, we'll call this one radial. And with our radial mask, I'm going to draw over our iceberg here. Again, soft. So we want to pull that in to a nice soft drop off with that mask. I don't actually want the inverse of this. So I've got to choose basically. I'm going to brighten the area of the iceberg and darken the area on the outside. So I can do it two ways. I can darken the mask like this and then brighten up the background. Or I can invert it, darken the background and brighten up the mask. Either way, I've got to do both steps. So let's invert it just so we're a bit clearer. So invert my mask. And along here, we can stretch this out a little bit there. And with this area, we're going to bring up our shadows a touch and up our brightness just a little bit. And to counter that again, so remember, this is all a balancing act. Let's go back to our background. And with this, we can pull down our brightness on the background. OK, the little bit of a distraction down here. I'm guessing that was either something from the boat that you were on um, or a, it could be a camera strap or it could be someone else's um, line or something like that. It's probably a line on the boat. Uh, we've got two options. One is we could try and heal it out. But to be honest, I don't think we necessarily need it um, because actually one thing that this shot does work well with, I believe, will be a one by two. So in our crop, I'm choosing one by two. As I pull this down, we're going to get to there. That looks pretty impressive. Let's get into here just a bit. So we've got a nice lead, maybe up to there. Let's look at that. That's looking pretty nice. If we didn't like the one by two, I would still be tempted just to come in a little bit tighter in two by three. So the original crop, um, but maybe to there, maybe that sort of works as well. OK, again, let's think about what we've done in terms of those layers. They're all small changes. So again, actually, if I go to our radial layer here, 
I'm going to make one other little change, which is to increase some clarity a little bit. Look at the def look at the difference in the detail in those uh, those bits of ice. So without and with, and we get that real pop in the ice. So clarity really, really does wonders with ice, especially icebergs. Um, so let's push that a little bit. We can afford to go a little bit more. Now there is a slight issue with sharpness on these. Um, if we look here, I've done it. Um, so at 100, well, where are we at? 250th of a second. It feels like it's a very fast shutter speed, but in practice, um, you you end up with a little bit of a, a knock because you're on a boat that's constantly moving. Um, but structure is going to help us quite a bit here. Now I don't want to do structure everywhere. If I do structure on the entire image, just go into our background layer here. As I pull structure up, we also get it out here. And then we start to see all the noise in the sky, all of the grain that we don't want to see. And we get these horrible little halos around all the detail points. So instead, let's not do structure globally. Let's do it again on this area of the ice. But let's think about this. We already have a mask for the ice, but the opposite, right? So if I show the mask here, okay, that's our sunset mask. So what if I were to create a new layer and call it iceberg? And on here, I'm going to, oh, sorry, on iceberg, I'm going to copy the mask from sunset. Okay. And we're going to invert the mask. Now, here's a problem because look what's happened. Why, why are we only now masking some areas of the iceberg and not all of them? We inverted it, right? Well, this is the problem. <laughs> because even though the mask has inverted, the red area has inverted, the luma range stays the same. So remember this, the luma range is independent of the mask. They sit, up, or they sit on top of each other, but they're independent. So the way to select the opposite to what we had before, it's, it's kind of annoying in a workflow, but this is where we're at. Um, I choose the mask from another layer and I apply it to my new layer. I then have to go into that same Luma range and invert the range. And you can see on there, we've now selected most of the ice. It's still not quite right. Um, so actually what we're gonna do is we're going to pull it, oh, sorry, going the other way. We're going to pull it up a bit. What have we got going on there? That's actually my masking in there that's a bit of an issue. So what we're gonna do is there, apply, and then with my brush, my mask, I can mask up to this ice. Now you'll see here, as I'm painting, it's not going above the, the ice. And there's a simple reason why not, because even though I'm painting a mask that's really, really rubbish and trash and whatever is all over the place, this Luma range is still applying, or the inverse of the Luma range is still applying to it. Okay. With that, I'm actually going to erase some of the mask down here. So, of course, remember the Luma range is on top of the red, so I can always go back to the red area and choose a different area to select. So I now have the opposite of my mask that was done for sunset. And on top of that, we have an inverted Luma range, so the dark parts, not the, uh, not the bright parts. And with that, we can pull up our structure and up our clarity a little bit more, which will give us the effect of sharpening. So if I turn that off, a little bit blurry, turn it on, really, really pops nice and sharp. So there we go, there's our before, and there's our after with all of that detail back in the ice and all the uh, the vividness um, that comes from it. And again, these are all on layers. So if we wanna pull it back a little bit, we can. If you wanna pull it up a little bit, we can, completely up to you. You can do whatever variance you want because we've got them all on sliders. So if I wanna reduce the amount of sunset impression I've got, well, I can pull that back and it softens it out. If I want to reduce the amount of glow we've got on the iceberg, well, I can pull the radial back or push it back in. If I want to reduce the sharpness on the iceberg, I can pull that back in as well. So that's the advantage of doing it on layers, and that's why we use layers. It's the most important thing. Okay, so that's our three edits for today. Um, Earl, we will get to you starting on our next session, which will be this Thursday. So we've got a before and after here. Where are we? It's up before and after. So that is drones uh, shot um in romania so there's our before there's our after with just a few little changes jeffrey shot of his dog so again we've got warmer um in our after we've got all that fur detail back all the texture back and we've got rid of this green line around the edge of him there and this little line here and then carla's iceberg we've gone from actually a really nice shot to start with but we just made it pop a little bit more we've punched it a little bit more and we've got those sunset colors back um poncho's just asked very quickly before we go uh, can you increase the red color on the chip yes and you know how um so let's just create a quick little mask uh 
it's going to be a very big mask if i wanted to now i want to be careful that we're only choosing the area that's on the ship so there's our ship there i would go into our color editor non-advanced i'm going to choose this red i don't want to spread it because i'm then going to get the sunset as well but with that red i could increase the saturation and i could increase the lightness if i really wanted it to pop i think we start going into an unreal territory if i'm honest if we push that too far but yes you could um you can get it to there okay guys uh right so really cool well done um nice shots three really nice shots to start with and they're really cool to edit so there we go um don't forget of course uh that we've got the facebook group stuff i am not up to date on that group um so i will try and spend the next day or two just getting up to date on some of the questions on there um we'll have the rerun of this for those of you that have problems at the start with youtube and sorry about that i'm not sure what happened but um something obviously odd went on um, but the replay will obviously have it without that um, without that jitter. And remember as well, you've got all of those pro tips things um, to watch if you don't know how the clarity tool works or how to edit astro pictures or whatever else. And for Thursday, so Thursday, this Thursday, the 15th, um, 3 o'clock normal time, uh, back to our Thursday slot, um, make sure you upload images using that tool. So poryforlive.wetransfer.com. Um, we can then play with your images next time um, and hopefully get some uh, some really cool ones as well, just like these today. In the meantime, um, stay safe, stay at home if you've been told to stay at home. Get out if you've been told to get out. I don't know how that works. Um, but we will catch you uh, on, well, three days' time. So stay safe in the meantime and we'll see you later. Cheers. Bye.